great joy to be here. And as Ben announced, I want to speak from the book of Numbers. Uh, this is, at first glance, not the most exciting book, but there's so much in it, I've struggled to know what to leave out. I uh, have been thrilled my, in my own soul to be reminded of what we have, and I've had to be selective to decide what would be best to share with you. I want to begin by reading some verses from Numbers chapter 9, verse 16. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And then in verse 11, as long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. And then on below, when the cloud lifted, they set out, and whether it was two days or a month or a longer time, and they continued in this manner. May God be pleased to bless the reading and the preaching of this is most holy and infallible word. Brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your spirit to rest upon every mind in this place in order that their perception of what I say will be received as you intend. Cleanse my tongue that I will be your transparent instrument to say what needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. Help me to be clear, simple. And may this be a word that brings great honor and glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Five principles that we are to learn from the book of Numbers. And the first, I want to share principles regarding guidance. Now, whereas in the Old Testament, the children of Israel had visible guidance, the pillar of fire, pillar of a cloud in the day, fire by night. Uh, there's nothing more wonderful than clear guidance. Uh, some years ago, I had the privilege of spending some time with Oral Roberts, and he shared a word that I've never forgotten. He said, do nothing until you feel the anointing. Well, I knew what he meant, but then I also recognize there are times when you don't feel the anointing, and you want to know, what is God telling me to do? Should I see this person? Should I accept this invitation? Should I take this vacation? Uh, should I marry this person? Should I buy this house or rent this place? We could go on and on. We have these questions, and sometimes you don't get clear guidance. Some years ago, I came up with an acrostic piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, and I've taught this pretty much all over the world, and I thought I would share it with you tonight, how to know God's will. The first thing you ask, is it providential? P, providential. What that means, does the door open? Is it easy? Do you have to knock down a door? Or it just opens? That's the first thing. If you have to knock a door down, not a good sign. I find that when God is in something, it just happens. But you need more than that. The letter E stands for enemy. Your enemy is the devil. Ask yourself the question, what do you suppose the devil would want you to do? And do the opposite, and you'll get it right. <laughs> the letter A, authority. What does the Bible say? If there's anything unbiblical about it, that settles it. But as long as you say, well, there's nothing in it against it in the Bible, proceed. Then the letter C, confidence. Does it increase 
or diminish. I find the more I am in the will of God, the more confidence I feel. Uh, Simon Peter used this word. The Greek word is parousia, confidence, boldness. On the day of Pentecost, the same man who six weeks before denied knowing Jesus even to a servant girl, now is so bold in front of all Jerusalem, speaking with such power. So when you're in the will of God, you're going to have confidence. And that's what Peter had. And then ease, the letter E, E E-A-S-E. What do you feel in your heart of hearts? I could quote Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to do anything that goes against your conscience. Now, for this acrostic to work, you need five out of five. It's not enough just because it's providential. Four out of five, not enough. But if you could put this through those five points, chances are you will be safe and to know what God wants you to do. Well, it's good to know that God is with you and giving you a sense of guidance. Proverbs 3, verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Well, that's the first thing that I wanted to share with you because the book of Numbers deals with this question of guidance for the children of Israel. And I want to say, God will give you guidance. St. Augustine said that God loves every person as though there were no one else to love. And God has a plan for you as if there were no other plans for for anything else. He's interested that much in you. But now let me come to the second thing. This is something we learn from the book of Numbers. And I sometimes see how important this is. Moses' leadership was questioned. And this happens today. Psalm 105, verse 15, touch not my anointed. We're living in a day when leadership is rare. Strong leadership. We're living in a day when there is a dearth of greatness in the world, whether it be politics or in the church. But when God raises up somebody, anointed one, one should respect that person. And Moses was the greatest leader of human beings in all history. And we're going to see something about his leadership, but it was actually questioned. And when you think that a great man like Moses could be questioned, and of all things, from his sister and from his cousin or relative, Aaron. Now, why would they question the leadership of Moses? Well, it's interesting. It was really a situation of jealousy. And they said to him, uh, Has the Lord only spoken through Moses? One of the dangers in the church, and Satan is looking for an entry point in every church to find someone who, through jealousy, will criticize leadership. The thing about jealousy is people never admit it. They never see it in themselves. I wrote a book some years ago on jealousy, the sin no one talks about. But that's what we have. Miriam and Moses and God stepped in. And indeed, he punished Miriam and she became leprous for a whole week. It wasn't permanent. God in mercy because Moses prayed for her. And uh, and so sometimes this happens. I remember years ago, Westminster Chapel, there for 25 years, in the space of 25 years, I had five assistants. I had three good ones, 
and two bad ones. The, the good ones were very, very good. The bad ones were very, very bad. And it was a case of a rival spirit. I learned something years ago. When you interview a person for a job and give them different questions or have them filled out this or that, there's one thing you can never know about for sure, and that is whether they will be loyal. You never can know in advance. Will this person be loyal? Well, Aaron turned out not to be loyal, and later on, he sided with Moses. But then, another problem, from not his family, but from the Levites, Korah, we read about it in Numbers chapter 16, verse 3, and Korah said to Moses, you have gone too far. And the way he put it, he said, uh, are you uh, actually saying that none of us can speak for God? Your whole congregation is holy. Are you the only one? And it's, uh, again, a case in which the devil is looking through a congregation. Uh, I have no way of knowing whether anything like that has happened here. I have every reason to think that it hasn't. Uh, but I can tell you this, be aware that the devil does not want unity. And he often will appeal through a person's jealousy. Now, that person will never admit that it's jealousy. But they begin to think, you know, I can do that as well as he. And this happened with a great person like Moses. So it's, it's interesting. Korah says to Moses, you've gone too far. What happened first? Moses just fell down on his face. And he thought, Lord, if you don't step in, there's nothing I can do. And then God gave Moses a word, and he said to Korah, you have gone too far. And it was an example of touching God's anointed. And the way God stepped in to vindicate Moses, he said, let's work out something. If you should die a natural death, then there's no way to know whether it was God who was dealing with you because everybody's going to die. But he put it like this in Numbers 16, verse 30. He says, but if the Lord creates something new, and if the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. Not me, but they have despised the Lord. And that is exactly what happened. You see, what Korah had done and his followers, they had uh, fallen prey to what we today would call the Peter Principle. I don't know whether you've ever heard of the Peter Principle. Very clever book written 45 years ago, uh, the thesis of the book was every person is promoted to the level of their incompetence. <laughs> and so he made the point, this is the problem. People have jobs they shouldn't have. Uh, the person who sweeps the floors uh, becomes uh, the secretary. And then the secretary becomes the vice president. The vice president becomes the president. All of them eventually reaching a level beyond their competence. Well, sometimes people will promote themselves to the level of their incompetence. They want that job. Uh, they're doing fine as manager of the office. But then when they're given a higher responsibility, it leads to burnout and nervous breakdown. And this is why things go wrong. Here's the principle. God will never promote you to the level of your incompetence. As long as you're following his guidance and you're not promoting yourself, 
and it's what he does, then you can be sure God put you there. Caution to anyone here. You have your eyes on that job. It would uh, give you a rise in pay. Uh, it will give you more prestige. And so you can say to your friends, well, look what I do now. The Holy Spirit will never promote you to the level of your incompetence. And what happened with Korah? He promoted himself. And God stepped in in this miraculous way. But I come now to the third principle. And this, to me, shows the greatness and the graciousness of Moses. There came a time when the burden was so great that God said, I will anoint certain people. And 70 people were given to the Spirit, taken from Moses and put on them, and they began to prophesy. But something interesting happened. Uh, we're told that uh, a couple of people prophesied that Joshua wasn't happy about and said, Moses, these two people are prophesying. Stop them. Moses replied, I would that all of God's people would prophesy. This to me points to something we're going to have in the future because I hold that the next thing to happen on God's calendar is not the second coming but an awakening of the church just before the second coming. I believe that the greatest awakening in the history of the church is coming. I think it's coming soon. And I'll tell you one thing about the next move of God. There will be no superstars. And we will be glad for anybody that prophesies. We're not just looking for somebody famous. I, I have dreamed of this. I envisage the day that right here in Times Square, there will be people taken from this congregation to go to the streets and prophesy and pray and cast out devils and heal people. And it won't be the Oral Roberts of these world. It will be ordinary people. And I want you to know that God has a work for people right here and a true leader wants everybody to be able to do this. Those who want to have the limelight and glory to themselves, then you can be sure it will not be an awakening of the Holy Spirit. And what Moses wants was the glory of God. I would that everybody would prophesy. But then we come to what I think is Moses' finest hour. Here's what happened. God said to Moses, I want you to have 12 people to go into Canaan and uh, see what it's like. And so they picked 12 people, one from each tribe, to test things in Canaan and uh, get some of its fruit, look at the people. And they came back, the 12 spies, 10 said, there's no way can we can do this. We were just grasshoppers. They are giants, and it's true that the grapes have come from a land flowing with milk and honey. No doubt about that, but we cannot ever conquer them. But there were two, Caleb and Joshua. And says, we certainly can. Our God is able to do it, and let's go for it. But they were outvoted 10 to 2. And it was that moment, and in that moment, when God swore in his wrath, these people will not enter my rest, and they didn't. And it was also in that moment that God was so angry with the people because they didn't believe in him that he called Moses aside. And he said, Moses, listen, this is a sorry lot you've got. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill them all of them, and you and I will start out with just a new nation. I wonder how many leaders would say, oh, good, kill them. <laughs> and I, I, I hate to admit to this, but there have been times in my ministry, 
I mean, over the years, if God said to me, RT, it's a bunch of bad guys. I'm just going to kill them. I think I would say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll tell you something. Years ago, in one of my darkest hours, I came across this verse of 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> Here's what Paul said. He said, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. I don't know, I love it. <laughs> and to grant relief to you who are afflicted. I said, well, praise God. And then a voice said, keep reading. <laughs> and it said, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. I thought, no, do I have to wait that long? <laughs> and I learned something that Moses taught us. It was Moses' finest hour when God said to Moses, I'm going to kill them all and just start out with you. We'll start a new nation. You know what Moses said? No, no, you can't do this. Your name is at stake. What are they going to say about you back in Egypt? They're going to say our God wasn't able to bring us into the Holy Land, into the Promised Land, into Canaan. You can't do it because your glory is at stake. This was Moses' finest hour when he interceded for the very people that wanted to kill him. And this is what is needed in a time like this, when we, instead of finding justification for getting even with our enemy, to pray for them instead. And that's what Moses did. And so, indeed it happened. And God spared them. He, God interceded for them and said, I have forgiven them, but it still remains the same. They would not enter into the promised land. We're talking earlier tonight about marriages being healed. I wonder if it has crossed your mind. If there's anyone here or anybody watching, your marriage is on the rocks and you're wanting vindication. You're wanting to show who's right and who's wrong. When I dare you, I challenge you, start praying for your wife. Start praying for your husband and ask God to bless them because showing bitterness is what the devil wants you to do. And ask not for vindication. Ask not to show that the other part partner is wrong, but pray that God will bless them and see what God will do with you. And this we learn from Moses. This was the secret of his greatness. I come to the next principle. Balaam. He was a false prophet whose name would live in infamy. Now, it's interesting about Balaam. Very strange character. We don't know as much about him as we would like. And because Balaam said to king of of, uh, of Moab, his name was Balak, said, I can only do what God tells me to do. It sounds good. I read a commentary some years ago on the book of Numbers and Balaam, and it was a liberal scholar who actually said Balaam was a good man. He was a good guy. And yet the New Testament unanimously says he was the opposite of that. What is it that the New Testament writer saw that liberal scholars cannot see. It's very subtle. The first thing is that God said to Balaam, have nothing to do with this man. You see, the king of Moab knew that Balaam was accurate in his prophecies, and he wanted Balaam to curse Israel. And God immediately said, have nothing to do with him. But Balaam wanted money, and he knew that Balak would give him a handsome fee. And so even though God said, have nothing to do with him, 
Balak kept praying for a word because he wanted that fee. He wanted, he could be bought with money. And yet he said, I can only say what God says. Now, to his credit, he would not curse Israel. And that's the reason some think he was a good man. But what was going on? Instead of Balaam listening to God and refusing to talk to Balak anymore, he kept hoping that God would change his mind. I wonder if you know what it's like to get a word from God, but you don't like it. You try to get another one. <laughs> and then you get a word at last that you like. It's all good. And the truth is, God told you originally what to do. Balaam, by disobeying God, taught Balak something about the children of Israel that he wouldn't have known if Balaam had kept his word or kept the word that God gave him and refused to have anything to do with Balak. Here's what it was. Balaam showed Balak something of the ways of God, and Balak had a way of getting Israel to be cursed, not by Balaam, but by God himself. You know how he did it? By getting the children of Israel to commit sexual sin, fornication, and adultery, and by teaching them how to do that, it caused God to turn against Israel and punish them. And this is the point that is made of the New Testament writers. He comes out of the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 14. You see, the devil knows God's ways. Jonathan Edwards made the point that our enemy, the devil, was trained in the university of the heavens. He knows God's ways. And the devil knows how to get God to punish us. And that's what happened. All because Balaam just wanted the money. Years ago, I came across a book. It's called the Didache. Some would pronounce it Didache. Second century a document that tells us how the early church thought about things. And there was a section in there, how to recognize a true prophet from a false prophet. You'll be surprised. Word is, if he asks money, he's a false prophet. You take that principle today, you will think of those people who are only trying to get your money, appealing to your greed for personal gain. And it's the spirit of Balaam. And this is something that comes out of the book of Numbers. Beware of those who appeal to your greed in order to advance their own ministries. I come now to the lesson we learn at last. And that is how the tribes of Israel got their land in Canaan. Now, you know, there were 12 tribes. And the next generation did go into Canaan. Uh, but there are 12 tribes. Where are they going to locate? And we learn it came by casting lots. Numbers chapter 26, verses 52 to 55. What was the point? It was out of their hands. So the leaders of Judah could not go to Joshua and say, look, let us live in this part of the land. And the people of Asher would say, no, look, we wanted that part. And then Naphtali says, could we live over here? And God took it out of their hands. And by casting lots, they got their inheritance. What do we learn about this in the New Testament? Every Christian is called to come into their inheritance. You see, when you're converted, when you're born again, God doesn't just shake your hand and say, I'll see you in heaven. But you live a life, and God has an inheritance for you. And God wants you to come in to your inheritance. And yet, God is the one that chose your inheritance. In fact, we're told in Psalm 47, verse 4, the Lord 
chose our inheritance for us. It's interesting that in Psalm 16, where David says in verse 8, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance. And you may say, well, he would say that. He's, he's king of Israel. But listen, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, resisting the flesh and the devil, and honoring God, I can tell you, you will be as thrilled with the way God has led you as he led David or anybody else. Because you come to see that God's plan for you is something that you could never come up with on your own. And you come to realize that in the family, you're now safe, knowing that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And you come to see God's plan for you. You could never have come up with it. The trouble is, many, because of disobedience, don't come into their inheritance. But God wants you to come into your inheritance. Uh, I could not have known 50 years ago that I would be a Bible teacher, and that I'd be speaking right here in what was once the Dominion Theater. I came here back in 1957, sat on the fourth row, about the seventh row over, and saw Julie Andrews and Rex Harrison in My Fair Lady. I wouldn't have known that 50 years later, I'd be preaching here, but I could. Well, the point is, over the years, I could have blown away my inheritance. There were these temptations. Take this job. Take this offer. I was offered a position that would give me prestige. But God said no, and I'm so glad I said no. I could go over my past. I'm just telling you. I would urge all of you, if you feel up to now, you've blown your inheritance. Remember this, that it's not too late. God will take you from where you are right now and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I messed up. I did this. I did this. Do you know, King David blew away his inheritance for a moment when he sinned with Bathsheba and then tried to cover it up by killing Uriah. But then there was a future for David. And it turns out that David's life later on turned out brilliantly. And it was a man after God's own heart. And if you have, up to now, done something that gives you reason to think you blew away your inheritance, God will do for you what he did for David. And you will be able to say, I have a delightful inheritance. That's what God does. You can't make it happen, but it's what he will do. But I have to say in closing, before you can come into your inheritance, you've got to be sure you're a member of the family. And I just quoted Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And there may be someone here who say, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And Paul would say to you, it wasn't for you. Paul said, we know that all things work together for good. It's for members of the family. And the members of the family, how could Paul say it? Well, it was true even if he hadn't said it. But the reason he said it is because it is true. He's found it out. And you, following the Lord, can see that whatever has happened in your past, God makes it work together for good. And that's for members of the family. Those outside the family don't see it. Those in the family say it's absolutely true. But here's the good news. You can be a member of the family. And God invites you to be a member of the family. At the natural level, you may be born to parents that are poor, or you can be born into privilege or into aristocracy. But with this, God will take you as you are. And the very fact that God could say through Jesus, Son of God, to Nicodemus, you must be born again. 
means you can do something about it. He wouldn't have bothered to say that if there weren't something you could do about it. And so I ask you a question. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Do you know that? Another question, if you were to stand before God, you will. And he were to ask you, he might, why should I let you into my family? Why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I want you to ask this question in your own heart. Do you know for sure if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And if you stood before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you in? And you had to give the right answer. There's only one answer. Give the wrong answer. You'd have to go someplace else. The Bible calls it hell. Don't go there. What would you say? What comes to your mind? If by now it doesn't come into your mind to say, because Jesus died for me on the cross. If that doesn't come to your mind, dear friend, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for anything in the world. But that can all change. It can change the next few seconds. If you don't know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven, I want you to pray this prayer. I won't ask you to pray it out loud. But you can pray it in your heart. God will see you. Just say these words. Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you. I'm sorry for my sins. Wash my sins away by your blood. I welcome your Holy Spirit into my heart. As best as I know how, I give you my life. Did you pray that prayer? Question, are you ashamed that you prayed that prayer? Why do you ask, R.T.? But Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm not going to ask you to make a speech, but I'm going to ask you to do something that may take a little bit of courage and something never crossed your mind that you would be doing. But if you prayed that prayer and not ashamed of it, in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you right where you are to stand up. You say, in front of all these people? Yep. You say, well, they'll, they'll, they'll know I've had a problem. But God is looking on. If you prayed that prayer, five, four, three, two, one. Stand to your feet if you prayed that prayer. Remain standing just for a moment. Remain standing just for a moment. Now, chances are that some standing, you were saved before tonight. That's possible. But if you've never prayed a prayer like that before or confessed Christ openly before, you know what just happened to you? You were just born again. Happy birthday. God bless you. You can sit down.